Greetings and peace, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today, I have the honor and privilege of being joined by Brother Richard E. Kretz, PhD, who's going to do a beautiful presentation on the Order of Ophicus. And the Order of Ophicus is a natural philosophy which focuses on knowledge and teachings that are sacred from Freemasonry, the Rosicrucians, from the Templars, and all of it combined in terms of finding out the aspect of philosophy, brotherhood of man, the philosopher's stone, ancient knowledge from the Sumerians, and the aspect of Mesopotamia, and the aspects of outer knowledge, and basically tying it all together in terms of this world that we're living in, who we are, what we stand for, and where is our world taking us. And please enjoy this presentation of Brother Richard E. Kretz, PhD, who's going to offer you a wonderful presentation on the Order of Ophicus, and you will learn everything, the aspects of what sacred knowledge ties all of this together, from Freemasonry to the Rosicrucians, Mesopotamians, and this philosophy of being in universal brotherhood, which is very direly needed today. So after this interview plays, which will play right after I uh, make this introduction, uh, you will see the presentation. And then after the presentation will be our Q&A session and our interview. So without further ado, here is uh, Brother Richard E. Kretz's presentation on the order of Ophicus. And after that, it will be our interview. Thank you. Greetings. This is a multi-part esoteric presentation about the Order of Ophicus, a natural philosophy that discusses sacred secrets encapsulated within Freemasonry, Templary, and Rosicrucianism, as well as their history. In this segment, we will discuss generalities pertaining to the Order of Ophicus and the Philosopher's Stone. The next segment is on evolution. The question posed is whether or not God could be a spaceman. Could God be a Captain Kirk on a starship like the Enterprise? Was he on a mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before? Did he employ a Genesis device for terraforming and or panspermia, as in the movie Star Trek III, The Search for Spock? we will see. Going forward, other segments will address such topics as our Mesopotamian roots, the Bible and the Emerald Tablets, the Merovingians and Charlemagne, the origins of the Templars and what they found in Jerusalem, Dr. John Dee, Sir Francis Bacon, and the evolution of modern Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry in the 16th and 17th centuries. The symbol of the Order of Ophicus is a green Ouroboros encircling a red cross of St. George. Overlaying the center of the cross is a white downward triangle over a black upward triangle. There is a dot or point in the center. The green Ouroboros denotes the duality of the regenerative cycle of nature, Alpha, Omega, Alpha. Overlaid on and encircling the cross of St. George, a solar cross is created, indicating we are ruled by the sun. The arms of the cross represent the four elements, fire, water, air, and earth, and the four cardinal directions, north, east, south, and west. They also represent time, as the solstices and equinoxes, and the four seasons. Overlaying the crux in the center of the circle is a white downward triangle, symbolizing knowledge of the sacred feminine overlaying a black upward triangle indicating wisdom acquired through experience and the fall of man. The merged white and black triangles also denote the union of opposites, male and female, black and white, wisdom and knowledge. Within the white triangle, centered on the crux, is a point within the circle of the symbol that binds all of the elements together. As a whole, the point within the circle of the symbol represents the soul of man within the spirit of the universe as we know it. The motto 
is nolti sotin. That means know thyself in Greek. In Latin, the phrase is nos te ipsum. It is the first of three maxims inscribed on the forecourt of the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. The other two maxims are nothing to excess and certainty brings insanity. And thus we have the symbol for the order of Ophicus. What is the order of Ophicus? The order of Ophicus is a system of natural philosophy that uses a Pythagorean approach to address metempsychosis. Inspired by natural philosophers of the past, the order of Ophicus considers that God exists and that he gave us the ability to reason in accordance with the theory of knowledge, epistemology. Therefore, in accordance with ideas and concepts found in Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry, Martinism, Hermeticism, etc., it's a wide-ranging quest for truth, using the seven liberal arts and seven universal principles as its platform. In this regard, order alludes to the arrangement or disposition of things in relationship to each other according to a particular sequence, pattern, or method. It is an attempt to discern the process cycle of divine love in accordance with the Pythagorean idea that all things are composed of numbers and that the principles of mathematics are the principles of all things that bind the terrestrial to the celestial. Its foundation is in ancient Greece and influenced by Egyptian and Mesopotamian cultures. Many ancient mystery schools, certainly Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry, are rooted in myth and legend involving Mount Parnassus of ancient Greece. It is here that we find ties of the celestial realm to our terrestrial world. Mount Parnassus effectively means the mountain of the house of the god, referring to Apollo, the sun god. Its snow-capped twin peaks can appear as a double A. Some may esoterically interpret these twin peaks as representing Apollo and his twin sister, Artemis, for whom Diana is the Roman equivalent and symbolic of duality. In Ovid's Metamorphosis, Mount Parnassus is where Duculon's art came to rest in the Greek flood myth. Corycean Cave, located on the slopes of Mount Parnassus, was sacred to Pan, whose homeland was rustic Arcadia, and to the nine muses who inspired music, poetry, literature, the arts, and sciences. Located high on the slopes of Mount Parnassus, where a sacred spring emanates from a vaporous cavern, is the Oracle of Delphi. To the ancient Greeks, Delphi was the navel, or omphalos, the center of the world. In ancient times, a beehive-shaped omphalos stone was kept in the inner sanctum of the temple. It was atop a column supported by a bronze tripod of three dancers. Parsaeans suggest that it had two gilded eagles on top of it, and that it was protected by a woolen cloth with precious stones in the form of a mermaid. It's said that in an attempt to locate the center of the earth, Zeus launched two eagles from opposite ends of the earth. From where their paths cross, Zeus threw a stone that landed at Delphi, marking the navel of the world. According to Greek mythology, the site at Delphi originally belonged to Gaia. Gaia was the Greek equivalent of the Sumerian goddess Ninhursag, a primordial deity who is the ancestral mother of all life and primal earth goddess. As such, she was also a Sithonic deity to whom black lambs were sacrificed. Gaia is often depicted as a reclining matronly woman holding a baby or surrounded by infant gods who were the fruits of the earth. The cave of the oracle symbolized the womb of the earth and was guarded by Gaia's giant serpent dragon child named Python. Apollo usurped Gaia's Sithonic powers by killing Python with his arrows, took possession of her oracle, and built his temple over Gaia's at Delphi. Afterwards, Apollo's priestess assumed the oracle's prophetic powers and the name Pythia in honor of slain Python. 
Another myth suggests that Apollo expelled Gaia's twin guardian serpents and wrapped their bodies around Hermes Caduceus. What we see in this image is that the engraving of St. George slaying the dragon is very reminiscent of an engraving of Apollo killing Python. The earliest evidence of an oracle at Delphi can be traced to about 1600 BC. Apollo's priests from Delos, associated with the rise of importance of the city of Corinth, took over the Doric shrine in about the 8th century BC, but retained the priestess as the oracle dedicated to Gaia to keep the peace. According to tradition, the first Pythia of the Apollo period was Femino, a poet and alleged daughter of Apollo. Initially, priestesses were young virgins from Delphi, but after Acrates of Thessaly kidnapped and violated a young and beautiful Pythia in the late 3rd century BC, a woman older than 50 years old was chosen for the position. Priestesses ceased all family responsibilities, marital relations, and forfeited their individual identity. Three priestesses usually served as the Pythia, two taking turns giving prophecy with another in reserve. Prophecies were only given during the nine warmest months of the year, and then during only one day of the month, on the seventh, as a ritual purification rite. According to the most popular theory, the Epsilon letter as a symbol is directly related to Delphic solar mysticism, the initiation of man into the light. Its placement on the pediment of the Delphic Temple of Apollo, the god of light or solar worship, indicates man's eternal relationship with the light, thus perfection. The letter E has three parallel lines, marking the union of body, mind, and soul, highlighting the trinity of human nature. The letter is the fifth number of the Greek alphabet, with the number five symbolizing the five elements needed for life according to the ancients, earth, air, water, fire, and ether. The Delphic Epsilon was placed at the top of the pediment of the Temple of Apollo, right at its center. At the lower left corner was the inscription, Know Thyself, while at the lower right corner was an inscription meaning, Nothing in Excess. These are known as the Delphic Commandments, and E was presiding over them. Pythagoras, who lived between 570 BC and 495 BC, combines Pythias as the root word of his name, denoting the cult of Apollo at Delphi, with agora, meaning assembly. Roughly then, Pythagoras translates to Apollo's assembly or society of Apollo and may or may not have been his actual birth name. In the 16th century, what remained of the moribund Knights Templar was remodeled and revitalized by Sir Francis Bacon. He merged the Templar's speculative Rosicrucian concepts and practices with the Freemasons' operative guild structure to create a society known as the Knights of the Helmet. While the Helmet referred to the Cap of Invisibility, also known as the Helm of Hades, worn by the goddess Pallas Athena during the Trojan War, the society was dedicated to her brother, Apollo. Sir Francis Bacon, as the titular head of the Knights of the Helmet, also known as the Invisibles, dedicated to Athena, was known as Apollo. And it should be noted that the Freemasons evolved separately from the Knights Templar to become like the Templar's chaplains, a category of Templar. Not all Masons were Knights Templar, nor were all Templars Masons. It's claimed that Pythagoras traveled and studied extensively abroad. The Egyptians are said to have taught him geometry, the Phoenicians arithmetic, the Chaldeans astronomy, and the Magi the principles of religion and practical maxims for the conduct of life. According to Diogenes Laertes, Pythagoras not only visited Egypt and learned the Egyptian language, but also journeyed among the Chaldeans and Magi. Later, in Crete, 
He went to the cave of Ida with Epimenides and entered Egyptian sanctuaries for the purpose of learning information concerning the secret lore of the different gods. The Middle Platonist biographer Plutarch writes in his treatise on Isis and Osiris that during his visit to Egypt, Pythagoras received instruction from the Egyptian priest, Enephus of Heliopolis. Other ancient writers also mention Pythagoras' visit to Egypt. According to the Christian theologian Clement of Alexandria, Pythagoras was a disciple of Sochus, an Egyptian arch prophet, as well as Plato of Secanufus of Heliopolis. Pythagoras was associated with Apollo and legendary even in his own time. He was said to dress all in white and wear a golden wreath upon his head. According to Aristotle, he showed Abaris, the Hyperborean, his golden thigh, proving that he was the Hyperborean Apollo. Aristotle also claimed in a fragment that when a poisonous snake bit Pythagoras, he bit it back, killing it. Allegedly, a priest of Apollo gifted Pythagoras a magic arrow that enabled him to fly over long distances and perform ritual purifications. Later, Roman legend claimed that Pythagoras was the son of Apollo and, according to Muslim tradition, he was initiated as a mystic by Hermes himself. In about 530 BC, Pythagoras established a school at Croton along the coast of southern Italy. Initiates were sworn to secrecy and practiced a communal ascetic lifestyle resembling that of later monasteries, inclusive of a form of vegetarianism. Pythagoras is credited with many philosophical, scientific, and mathematical ideas, including metempsychosis, or the transmigration of the soul that suggests that every soul is immortal and, upon death, enters a new body. Musica universalis, or harmony of the spheres, that suggests the planets move according to mathematical equations and resonate to produce an inaudible symphony of music. Pythagorean tuning, which is a system of musical tuning in which the frequency ratios of all intervals are based on a ratio of three to two. He determined that the morning and evening stars were the planet Venus. Pythagorean theorem, also known as the 47th problem of Euclid, fundamental to Euclidean geometry. He divided the earth into five climactic zones, identified the sphericity of the earth, the five regular or platonic solids, numerology, believing all things are composed of numbers, that the principles of mathematics were the principles of all things, the theory of proportions, and he devised the tetractus. Ophicus means serpent bearer in Greek, and he's depicted as Apollo wrestling the serpent python. He was also considered a great healer and associated with Asclepius, a son of Apollo. According to mythology, Asclepius was taught the art of medicine by Chiron, the centaur. One day Asclepius saw a snake resurrect another snake by laying herbs on it. He began using those herbs and not only healed the sick, but managed to raise the dead. In another story, Asclepius was given the power by the goddess Athena to resurrect the dead, including Orion that Asclepius learned the secret of immortality upset Hades, the god of the underworld. Hades complained to Zeus that the flow of souls to the underworld would cease because of what Asclepius was doing. Zeus agreed and killed Asclepius with a lightning bolt, placing him among the stars as the constellation Ophicus, the serpent bearer. The constellation of Ficus straddles the celestial equator opposite the asteroid of Orion. Technically, it doesn't belong to the zodiac family of constellations, rather to the Hercules family of constellations. There are only 12 zodiacal signs inside real astrology.
However, some incorporate Ophicus as a 13th sign between Scorpio and Sagittarius from approximately November 29th to December 17th, based on the 1st century AD astronomical poem Astronomica by Marcus Manilius. Inclusion of Ophicus as a 13th sign makes sense if we consider the zodiac as 12 plus 1, and that Ophicus is neither ruled by a planet nor associated with an element. As such, it suggests that Ophicus is separate and superior. Ruling or overseeing the zodiacal signs in a 12 plus 1 capacity. Rooted in antiquity, there are many examples of 12 plus 1. For example, Abraham and his 12 sons, Jesus and his 12 apostles, Hercules and his 12 labors, Arthur and his 12 knights, a judge and 12 jurors, etc. Keep in mind that 12 plus 1 is also an anagram for 11 plus 2, that both phrases use the same 13 letters. In October 1604, Johannes Kepler observed and documented a new star in the angle of Ophicus. Known as Kepler's supernova, it was visible from October 1604 through April 1606. At one point, it was seen during the day for a period of three weeks. Astrologers of the time, including Dr. John Dee, considered it as fulfillment of the prophecy of Paracelsus, that astronomical events of 1603 and 1604 were signs and harbingers of approaching revolution. There is nothing concealed which will not be revealed. Flood stated that the 1604 celestial events were a sign for the Rosicrucians to emerge from their period of secrecy, to expand their membership, and begin restoration of the world. It's at this time that we find Freemasonry beginning to emerge in London, spreading to Germany, France, Italy, and the New World. The Mathematical Structure of the Order Using Theosophical Addition and Reduction, 12 plus 1 equals 13. That reduces to 4. 1 plus 2 plus 1 equals 4. The number 13 also reduces to 4. 1 plus 3 equals 4. 4 being the number representing stability and the body symbolized by a square. We can also consider 12 plus 1 as a numerology equation of 12 plus 1 equals 13 equals 1 plus 3 equals 4. A monad whereby 1 represents a negative entity female or downward triangle, merged through the spirit of divine love, symbolized as an encircled hexagram, with a dyad, whereby two represents a positive entity, male or upward triangle, that creates a divine spark in accordance with the law of entropy. Change, or delta, occurs that produces a negative, a female or one or a downward triangle, as an offspring or entity, a child. The female offspring or child, resulting from the union of opposites of negative or female and positive or the male, creates stability and balances the female-male relationship. We can extrapolate this as 1 plus 1 equals 2, in that according to most ancient cultural beliefs, a primordial goddess produced a male child through parthenogenesis and bred with him to produce subsequent pro uh, progeny, equating to 1 plus 2 equals 3. Furthermore, we can look at it as 13 equals 3 times 4 plus 1 equals 12 plus 1, whereby 1 is the spirit or monad of the mother, father, daughter triad formed by the merger of their minds, 3 as a triangle, and bodies, 4 as a square as the spirit of the sacred feminine, or one, or one omega one equals alpha omega alpha.
as an equation, this may appear as This is another way of looking at the equation. The union of opposites can also be depicted as a union of the celestial and terrestrial. A merger of the divine masculine that is positive, Mars representing Aries, with the divine feminine that is negative, Venus representing Cassiopeia. Fertilizes spiritual knowledge, seeing this as a swan containing the northern cross, through the Milky Way, also known as the Celestial River, across the terrestrial equator, where you find the constellation Norma, with experience that merges to form wisdom. Mercury as Thoth or Hermes in Sagittarius that produces twins, Gemini, symbolized as the twin pillars, Castor as Boaz and Jachin as Pollux, found by navigating the middle passage of the Winter Triangle formed by Sirius and Canis Major, Betelgeuse in Orion and Procyon in Canis Minor, and sailing between Castor and Pollux. The union of opposites is a segue to metempsychosis and the Philosopher's Stone as it relates to the union of the two hemispheres of the brain by the central nervous system regulated or anchored by the pineal gland, pituitary gland, and the thalamus as an electrical system. It represents finding a passage between opposites and allegorically symbolizes finding the third eye between the two hemispheres of the brain. We can also see that it addresses the brain and central nervous system as an electrical circuit delineated as a lightning flash in the tree of life and as the chakras when overlaid on a caduceus. The idea of a ship sailing between two pillars, symbolizing a compromise between the polarity of hemispheres of the brain, is introduced in Greek mythologies Jason and the Argonauts in their quest for the Golden Fleece as their ship sailing through the Symphalagades or Clashing Rocks. Later, the idea was incorporated by natural philosophers such as Sir Francis Bacon as a reference to the Philosopher's Stone. Axioms. These are ideas to think about. What is the speed of thought? If the speed of light is 186,282 miles per second in a vacuum, what then is the speed of thought? Speed is measured as time over distance, but does distance apply to thought? If distance as a variable is not applicable to thought, then our formula for calculating its speed will not work. Perhaps thought is pure energy, and its speed is calculated as the speed of light squared multiplied by its mass. Does thought have mass? It has been suggested that the universe is a thought-generated hologram and that all other energies are harmonic manifestations of it. If the universe were indeed a thought-generated hologram and all energies harmonic manifestations of it, is it to suggest past, present, and future thoughts are concurrent, existing simultaneously? Past, present, and future 
are elements of time, a man-made construct. So how and why are these elements of time differentiated in a hologram? Is time parsed as a sequential part of a process, reconciled as a harmonic vibratory manifestation akin to the visible light spectrum? Can we use time as a variable to calculate the speed of thought? Is the speed of thought constrained by distance and time? Or is the speed of thought instantaneous, or at least beyond our present ability to measure it? When is a thought formed or conceived? Are thoughts conceived in a vacuum? Or are they conceived in conjunction with and are they influenced by other thoughts or knowledge? Is inception or conception of thought identifiable, measurable, quantifiable? Is thought an emanation of light, photons? Does an increase in photon emission equate to enlightenment? The Fall of Man Man is his own worst enemy reflected not in a mirror, but by his shadow that follows him everywhere, stalking him, haunting him, reminding him constantly of what he fears most, himself. Knowledge comes to each of us from many places and in many ways. When we have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to recognize and appreciate it for what it is. When we are duly and truly prepared to receive it, knowledge comes. What is allegory? Language is important because it enables us to communicate, to convey knowledge, ideas, and abstract concepts. Linguistic history is the magical marriage of word and meaning, sounds and embodiments that intonate storied treasures of color through grammar, rhetoric, and logic, fundamental to allegory. The Fool and the Hermit Occult means that which is hidden or closed off from view. Esoteric means arcane, mysterious, or secret, intended for, or likely understood by, only a few people with specialized knowledge or interest. Study of the occult by the esoteric is a journey, not a destination. It's a treacherous, narrow path few travel, one illuminated by nothing more than the pale glow of our heart's hope. We begin as fools, as quixotic knights errant, who, in need of psychological space, have withdrawn from society, retreating to chambers of reflection. We become meditative and contemplative, absorbed in self-examination and reassessment, unaware of the inherent dangers of windmills, inner space explorations, and are oblivious to warnings. Thus along, Ruffians are encountered, and incidents occur. We must remember Our Lady, and in whom we place our trust. As we quest, we suffer. We experience pain and acquire knowledge. We grow. Applied knowledge improves with lessons learned through experience as it rises in quality, budding and blossoming as wisdom, strength, and beauty much like Aaron's rod. We have become better than we once were. We have changed and transformed, evolving as a hermit, as a spiritual advisor, a wise person, a teacher, and a mentor. Aged and cloaked in humility and wisdom, acquired by many years of experience, the hermit holds his lantern of knowledge high on the mountain, illuminating the occult path that esoteric fools may follow his light.
the Philosopher's Stone. Richard Fenneman is quoted as saying, trying to understand the way nature works involves a most terrible test of human reasoning ability. It involves subtle trickery, beautiful tight ropes of logic on which one has to walk in order not to make a mistake in predicting what will happen. The quantum mechanical and the relativity ideas are examples of this. I'm confident this applies to the Philosopher's Stone as does his blackboard quote at the time of his death. What I cannot create, I do not understand. Legends pertaining to the Philosopher's Stone are shrouded by the mist of time. Zosimus of Panopolis, also known as Zosimus the Alchemist, was an Egyptian alchemist and Gnostic mystic who wrote about it in about 300 AD. Other alchemists, such as Elias Ashmole, claim its history originates with Adam, who obtained it from God. It is also alluded to in Psalm 118.22 of the Bible as the rejected cornerstone of King Solomon's temple. Zosimus described creation of the Philosopher's Stone as working with prima materia, or first matter. Prima materia is the primitive, formless base of all matter, like chaos. It is the material that fills the celestial world above, the terrestrial sphere. Esoteric alchemists compare prima materia to the concept of anima mundi, also known as the universal soul or breath of God. Anima mundi suggests that there is an intrinsic connection between all living things as the soul is connected to the body. The process of working with prima materia is known as the magnum opus, or great work. In the Hermetic tradition, it describes spiritual transmutation as chemical color changes occurring in a laboratory. Birds, such as ravens, phoenixes, and swans, are symbolic of progression through the colors of black, red, and white aspects of the stone. The Philosopher's Stone is also referred to as the elixir of life. Symbolizing perfection and enlightenment, it is used for rejuvenation, to achieve immortality, and to turn base metals into gold. As such, the Philosopher's Stone is a symbolic alchemical marriage of our celestial mind to our terrestrial physical body, bound by the energy of our spirit. This alchemical marriage requires change, transmutation, attained during a quest for perfection. Our quest is for unity, peace, and harmony of mind, body, and spirit, so that in death our soul is resurrected to live eternally. Ancient alchemists were crafty. According to eminent psychologist Carl Jung in Psychology and Alchemy, their motto was obscurum per Obscurus. Explain the obscure by the more obscure. Alchemists encrypt their quest for the Philosopher's Stone using metaphor and allegory. We find pursuit of the stone described using a variety of cryptic illustrations and mathematics. Two examples of those are Sir George Ripley in the Ripley Scroll and Count Michael Meyer in Atalanta Fusions. Ripley describes his quest for the stone using symbolic illustration. In contrast, Meyer's approach uses sacred geometry. Alchemy, Hermetics, sacred geometry, Kabbalah, Gematria, astrology, and other occult arts and sciences all allude to the stone in their own vague way. Left to speculation, it's difficult to empirically describe what the stone really is. A quest for the Philosopher's Stone is a quest for the Grail, a search for truth. What we seek is elusive because, one, it appears as an intangible idea. Two, because it appears to be an intangible idea, we have difficulty visualizing it and may not recognize it for what it is. To recognize the stone, we must have eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. This is to say we must shift our paradigms 
and seek it with an open mind, without constraint or construct. We must use what knowledge we have of the stone as an intangible idea to develop a tangible model. What Aristotle called matter, Thomas Aquinas called prime matter. Matter that Aquinas saw and was tangible, he considered to be a result of a union between prime matter and form that he called second matter, known in alchemy as the body of matter or salt. Later alchemists improved on Aquinas' idea and changed their reference of prime matter to first matter. Thus, in alchemy, we have first matter, second matter, and form that equates to mercury, salt, and sulfur, also known as the spirit, body, and soul. Given two like objects of different color and weight, an alchemist will tell you that there is one similarity and one difference between them. The similarity is that they're both matter. The difference is that they are two kinds of matter. Other perceived differences, such as color, weight, density, etc., are accidental qualities that revolve around one essential nature. Aristotle concluded that matter and form were two principles concealed in matter. In simple terms, the form of matter is that which is tangible and can be seen. While matter has mass and weight, it has no form or accidental properties. And while it can't truly be seen, it has the appearance of a cloud, mist, or vapor. It is this cloud that's condensed into a universal chaotic water, the principle of all things. Salt, sulfur, and mercury are symbolic allegorical terms, not the substances available for purchase at an apothecary or chemical supply firm. Indeed, these substances are said to have a thousand names. Timothy Hogan in Alchemical Keys to Masonic Rituals says, we also learn from fellow craft instruction and cornerstone ceremonies of the corn, wine, and oil, or traditional Masonic wages, which in traditional alchemical symbolism and text were said to be associated with salt, mercury, and sulfur, respectively. Corn represented by the body, or salt of the herb. Wine carried the symbolic spirits, and the sulfur of an herb was its oil. These are sprinkled on a cornerstone, just as the compiling of the three principles of salt, sulfur, and mercury into a stone was said to be the creation of a philosopher's stone of alchemy. Again, we find that salt, mercury, and sulfur symbolize not only the body, spirit, and soul, but also as corn, wine, and oil. What do we know about the philosopher's stone? We know its name. Philosopher translated from the Greek literally means Philo's wisdom or wisdom of Philo. So we know it has something to do with wisdom. In general, a stone is defined as a hard substance formed of mineral matter that can be shaped for building or carving. Therefore, the name philosopher's stone could allude to shaping the wisdom of one's body and mind. We know that working with the stone involves the elements of fire, water, earth, air, and spirit in three stages alluded to in the colors of black, red, and white. We also know that the stone involves geometric forms such as circles, lines, triangles, and squares. Our challenge is to figure out how to combine what we know to develop a functional model that we can see. There is a Masonic reference to a geometric form known as an oblong square. Some think it alludes to a rectangle, specifically a golden rectangle, but perhaps it's something else, something significant with broad implications. Perhaps an oblong square is a master key that unlocks the mystery of the universe. Perhaps an oblong square is the philosopher's stone. When we consider the term oblong, an ovoid shape, 
a geometric form with rounded edges like a racetrack comes to mind. A square by its nature is formed by straight, not rounded lines. Logically then, an oblong square must be a square that has rounded sides. But how do we compose such a form? In masonry, we are taught that the form of a lodge should always be an oblong square, in length between the east and the west, in breadth between the north and the south, in height from earth to heaven, and in depth from the surface to the center. The question remains, what is an oblong square? Whatever an oblong square may be, our Masonic description suggests that it's three-dimensional. To create an oblong square, or the stone, we begin with a point within a circle. We then square the circle and add circles on both sides. As a two-dimensional form, an oblong square appears as a racetrack. Let's advance this idea of an oblong square through application. If we take our two-dimensional oblong square and make it three-dimensional, what does it look like? Without removing the interior lines, we have three spheres within a cube. A central sphere bounded by a cube, conjoined by spheres right and left, dissected by the cube. As a singular unit, this configuration is akin to a capsule. How is an oblong square applied to the Philosopher's Stone and Masonry? Alchemists claim that the stone is white and has dual aspects in accordance with Hermetic principles. The colors red and white differentiate these aspects. Red symbolizes the physical, terrestrial, tangible nature of the stem, our body, represented geometrically by a square. As such, the red stone is referred to as the lesser work. The white stone is referred to as the greater work. White symbolizes the mental, celestial, higher intangible nature of the stone, our mind, represented geometrically by a triangle. The triangles found within the stone aren't discerned until we connect the points of contact between the circles divided into fourths and the square, at which time we find a hexagram. In describing the process for creation of the stone, two components stand out, water and salt. Water is a molecule composed of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. An oxygen atom has eight electrons orbiting its nucleus, two electrons in the inner shell and six in an outer shell. Hydrogen has only one electron orbiting its nucleus. A water molecule is composed of three interlocking spheres, as is an oblong square. Water is the largest, most powerful, and sublime elemental force. Water covers approximately two-thirds of Earth's surface and comprises approximately two-thirds of an adult human body. Our bodies require water to function and survive. In the brain, Water is needed to manufacture hormones and neurotransmitters. It allows our body's cells to grow and reproduce. It's used to deliver oxygen throughout the body for digestion, regulation of body temperature, flushing waste, lubrication, and shock absorption. Water is cyclical, existing in the three states of the alchemical recipe for the Philosopher's Stone, solid, liquid, and gas. Water rises into the air above the earth as a gas and returns to earth below as either a liquid or solid precipitate. 
As such, it is found coming from the heavens above as rain and snow, and emanating from the ground below from springs and streams. In the human body, water is comparably consumed, circulating within and expelled without. Oceans are bodies of water that cover the earth. The oceans are where life began on earth. We gestate in and are born from a body of water. Water satisfies the hermetic axiom, as within, so without, as above, so below. Water has no beginning or end. Water is part of life. Life is part of water. Water is life. Having three components and existing in three states, water represents a downward triangle. The energy required for water to exist in its three states is influenced by the element of fire. Fire is represented as an upward triangle formed by the triad of heat, fuel, and oxygen. Oxygen binds water and fire as exemplified in a hexagram created by the electrons of its atomic structure. It's interesting that hydrogen is extremely flammable and oxygen is an accelerant, yet when combined they form a third entity that doesn't burn and can extinguish its individual components. Esoterically, we could say that a water molecule is the monad plus the dyad that creates the triad. Nicholas Flamel tells us what the stone is in his hieroglyphical figures when he writes, Our stone hath a symbobly to a man, body, soul, and spirit. Hermes, according to the golden treatise of Hermes Trismegistus concerning the physical secret of the philosopher's stone by M. A. Atwood, offers us an allegorical clarification when she says, Know then, that the division was made upon the water by the ancient philosophers separates it into four substances, one to two and three to one, the one third part of which is color, that is to say a coagulating moisture. But the two third waters are the weights of the wise. What Hermes is telling us is that of the three, only the body is visible as the spirit and soul are invisible. In the six keys, Exodus says, there are three different substances and three natural principles of bodies, salt, sulfur, and mercury, which are the spirit, the soul, and the body. This too we find expanded on in a German alchemical poem published in The Secret Symbols of the Rosicrucians. The salt that is corpus is the very last in the art. The sulfur is the soul, henceforth, without which the body can create nothing. Mercurius is the spirit of power that brings together both body and soul. Thus, it is called medium, without which nothing can endure. Steve Richards, in his book, Invisibility, provides an excellent analogy. Another way of looking at it is to consider the condensation of steam to form first water and then ice. Water, steam, and ice represent what scientists call the three states of matter, liquid, gaseous, and solid, and what alchemists call three of the four elements. Richards further quotes Albert Poisson who said, in the chemical theory, the four elements are simply states of matter. Simple modalities. Water is synonymous with the liquid state, earth with the solid, air with the gaseous, and fire with a very subtle gaseous state, such as a gas expanded by the action of heat. Moreover, elements represent, by extension, physical qualities such as heat or fire, dryness and solidity, earth, moisture and fluidity, water, cold and subtlety, air. Zosimus gave to these the name Tetrasomy. With the above in mind, we can create a model of man as water and in an elemental form that includes the red and white stones, heart 
and mind. Salt or salts is frequently referred to in the Philosopher's Stone alchemical process. Salt is a compound created by combining sodium and chlorine to create sodium chloride. Sodium chloride dissolves in water and is what makes our oceans salty. Salt is necessary for life and is found in the extracellular fluids of multicellular organisms. Since ancient times, Salt has been obtained through the evaporation of seawater to obtain sea salt, or mining and quarries to obtain rough ashlers of rock salt. In ancient times, salt was considered more valuable than gold, and often alluded to as the white powder of gold. Sodium and chlorine form ionic bonds. As a crystal, these bonds create a two-atom-based cube, three bonds in height, three bonds in length, and three bonds in depth, a perfect ashlar. In Adelata Fusions, Meyer could be describing salt as the philosopher's stone when he quotes racis. The stone, he says, is a triangle in its essence, a quadrangle in its quality. Indeed, a salt crystal is a triangle in its essence and a quadrangle in its quality. When a salt crystal is combined with a water molecule, it takes the form of an oblong square. Salt dissolved in water isn't visible to the naked eye, yet it's hidden in plain sight. If water containing dissolved salt is distilled completely, an experienced alchemist will find that a few small cubical grains of a white stone remain, perfect ashlers. An inexperienced person would not be able to see these stones if any water remained in the vessel during distillation. He would therefore unknowingly heap these stones over into the rubbish pile. Salt, like water, is necessary for life. It could be argued that salt is the philosopher's stone in a physical, terrestrial sense. A hexamer, six molecules, of water is the minimum volume required to dissolve one molecule of salt. When dissolved, salt's molecular structure of sodium and chlorine separate to combine with water. In our body, sodium regulates blood pressure by attracting and holding water in our blood. Muscles and nerves require sodium for the electrical currents they generate to properly function. The amount of salt in our body must be balanced. Too much or too little salt can cause health problems. The combination of salt and water appear a likely candidate as the Philosopher's Stone, but there is another, carbon. Another key component of life on Earth is carbon. The most important characteristics of carbon as a basis for the chemistry of life are it has four valence electrons. And the energy required to make or break a bond is at an appropriate level for building molecules that are stable and reactive. Carbon atoms bond readily to other carbon atoms. This allows the building of long complex molecules. Complex carbon molecules also readily bond with other elements, especially oxygen and hydrogen. Again, we find reference involving oxygen and hydrogen. For example, carbon dioxide, one carbon atom, and two oxygen atoms. In addition to its chemistry, carbon's ability to conduct electricity varies with its hardness. In its soft state of graphite, its black is used in pencils to draw and write with and conducts electricity. In its hardest state as a diamond, created under immense pressure, carbon is clear and a very poor conductor of electricity. As such, Alchemically, carbon could be considered a contender as the stone, since it begins as a soft black slab, changing color and hardness with pressure until it becomes a small white diamond. Carbon's four valence electrons form a square, and its atomic number is six because it has a total of six electrons. So, while carbon has attributes of the Philosopher's Stone, it's not the stone itself, nor does it singularly support an oblong square? 
However, carbon could be part of the stone. As with water and salt, carbon is necessary for life on Earth. Carbon appears to satisfy the alchemical process of the stone. Geometrically and numerologically, it also supports aspects of the stone as it readily bonds with oxygen and hydrogen and forms a square. Carbon provides an explanation for having a fourth circle or sphere found in Kabbalistic, chakra, and hermetic models. It also supports sacred geometry and numerology. The stone, therefore, is about life and is composed of life's three key ingredients, water, salt, and carbon. We can now create a visual model of the stone that addresses the five elements and their interaction in an alchemical process that does indeed support masonry's oblong square. Ancient Mesopotamians expressed the idea of the Philosopher's Stone representing water and salt, life and death, as an oblong square in reliefs. In this relief, we see the oblong square in the center symbolizing the cycle of life as a fountain representing the universe. In Egyptian legend, an oblong square is also featured as the Philosopher's Stone. In this graphic, Isis and Thoth resurrect Osiris, who is kneeling at an acacia tree. The acacia tree symbolizes the tree of life and life everlasting. We also find that the Egyptians used an oblong square to identify pharaohs as enlightened beings related to the gods by placing their name within a cartouche. In the Hindu culture of India, we find an oblong square represented as a Shiva Lingam stone. According to the Linga Purana, a lingam is a column or oval stone that symbolizes the universe and the Hindu god Shiva. Shiva is said to be timeless, formless, pure consciousness, power, and the primal substance of all that exists. In medieval times, an oblong square was used as floor plans for cathedrals, such as the Cathedral's Notre Dame in France. Water, salt, and carbon are necessary for life. Together, their molecular structures form an oblong square, a capsule. In nature, an oblong square is found in the form of bacteria, eggs, and seeds. When an egg or seed is fertilized, a divine spark occurs at conception, creating a soul. This is when life begins. In this way, an oblong square, the red stone, satisfies physical principles of nature and hermetics and the laws of thermodynamics. When a seed or egg is fertilized, energy is converted. A soul is formed in accordance with the first law of thermodynamics the law of conservation of energy. The second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy, says that energy disperses creating chaos. For chaos to perpetuate, order is required. Nature creates pockets of order through life. Life disperses energy. The more life, the better energy is dispersed. Life obeys and exists because of the law of entropy. Life as the redstone represents our heart and circulatory system, the first of our organs to develop. An oblong square encapsulates the celestial principles of mathematics, geometry, and vibration, and addresses the soul. The white stone, symbolized by the skull and spinal column, represents our brain and central nervous system, our mind. Our brain and central nervous system develop once our heart and circulatory system are established. When we overlay an oblong square and the eye of Horus on our brain, Masonic correlations begin to appear in their relationships. In masonry, pillars and the oblong square are used to represent the brain and spinal column. The pillars of Boaz and Jacob symbolize the left and right hemispheres of the brain. 
The three pillars of masonry represent the thalamus, pineal gland, and pituitary gland within the brain, symbolized as an oblong square. The five pillars of masonry, placed atop one another, signify the spinal column. In the context of the Fellowcraft degree, the winding staircase refers to the spinal column. The porch is the brain stem. The middle chamber is the brain within the skull. And the sanctum sanctorum is the third eye comprised of the thalamus, pineal gland, and pituitary gland. The stone, via an oblong square and columns, is a path to resurrect and perpetuate our soul. This path is known as the way, is addressed in masonry, the staff of Hermes, the chakras, and the Kabbalah. The way is found within us. The way is a means of harmonizing our mind, body, spirit, and soul with the universe. Attainment of universal harmony, oneness, is referred to as enlightenment. An enlightened person is often said to have seen the light, or is depicted wearing a halo representing light. In this regard, the stone is the celestial elixir of life that offers immortality. Now that we know what the Philosopher's Stone and Oblong Square are, the question is how do they precipitate change? How are they used to convert our mind and body from lead into gold? The answer is meditation. Meditation is a vehicle for us to change. Meditation harmonizes our mind and body. Performance guidance for meditation is provided in the metaphor and allegory of Masonic lectures. Masonic lectures incorporate instruction for the application of hermetic principles and concepts of sacred geometry. These principles and concepts provide that the brain and central nervous system perform as an electrical circuit, having correlation with the caduceus, chakras, and the Kabbalistic tree of life through the pillars of masonry as an oblong square. An electrical circuit possesses and transmits information. A power source, our brain provides electrons for the circuit. Electrons have positive and negative charges. Movement of electrons within an electronic circuit creates energy. Three principles of a charge created by electrons and their movement are voltage, current, and resistance. An electronic circuit is considered closed or on when its circuit is complete and uninterrupted. It is open or off if there is a break in the circuit. For a circuit to operate correctly, it must be closed and the amount of voltage, current, and resistance balanced so that positive and negative electrons flow properly into a component in accordance with its tolerance, such as a lamp, and back out along a neutral route to ground. When a lamp is illuminated by an electrical circuit, it emits photons that we perceive as visible light. Electronic circuits use components such as inductors, capacitors, and resistors. An inductor provides a capacitor a constant charge, while the resistor reduces decay of the current flowing to the inductor. Together, they create an electromagnetic frequency that vibrates known as resonance. When such a circuit is tuned and balanced so that it functions at optimum vi vibration, it becomes a simple harmonic oscillator that generates electrical waveforms. Our brain, represented as an oblong square, is comparable to the capsule-like symbol of a servo mechanism. In fact, our brain functions as a servo mechanism. A servo mechanism is a feedback control system in which the mechanical position of an object is automatically maintained using error-sensing feedback to correct the action of a mechanism. It usually includes a built-in encoder to ensure the output is achieving the desired effect. A harmonic generator is a component of the encoder. Our brain is a power source of electrical force, while our nerves act as the wires along which the electrical force flows within our body. 
as a harmonic generator, our brain's third eye, our thalamus, pineal gland, and pituitary gland regulate and coordinate all functions within the body. Our brain uses feedback to adjust, just like a servo mechanism. The thalamus performs as an inductor controlling consciousness, sensory, and motor signals that maintain equilibrium, decision. The pineal gland acts as a capacitor to store and modulate patterns and rhythms, thought. The pituitary gland functions as a resistor, regulating the flow of psychological and physiological processes, emotion. As a triad, these components form our third eye. We attain enlightenment when our third eye is balanced and resonates as a harmonic waveform generator, about 110 hertz. Opening and closing of our third eye is simulated in the opening and closing of the Royal Arch Degree by We Three Do Agree, this Royal Arch to raise or close. Our spine consists of 32 vertebrae divided into five areas, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccyx. If we include our skull, it makes 33 skeletal components. It equates to the five pillars of masonry, caduceus, and chakra points, and houses the central nervous system. The central nervous system is the wiring harness that connects the brain to the body. It is comprised of sympathetic nerves that are positive energy, parasympathetic nerves that are negative energy, and vertebral ganglia that provide a neutral return path to ground. Peripheral nerves from all parts of the body join the central nervous system along the spine where they are controlled and coordinated by the brain. These positive and negative electrical forces crisscross through neutralizing ganglia of the spinal cord to various parts of the body. This is exemplified in the cabalistic lightning flash and chakras and is illustrated as a system using a caduceus. The completed circuit runs from the thalamus to the pineal gland to the pituitary gland and returns to the thalamus where it is discharged. In his book, A New Earth, Eckhart Tolle writes, the fires of suffering become the light of consciousness. Suffering drives you deeper. A lot of it is caused by the ego although eventually suffering destroys the ego, but not until you suffer consciously. Suffering has a noble purpose, the evolution of consciousness and the burning up of the ego. The truth is that you need to say yes to suffering before you can transcend it. Suffering is therefore an element of metamorphosis. It's a part of the slow, painful transition from one state of being or consciousness to another. We are born and must die if we are to be reborn as something different, conceivably something better than we once were. Whether that death is physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual, death is a part of life and necessary for rebirth. Another vehicle for enlightenment is meditation. Knowing that our body is much like an electrical circuit, we now know that we must be grounded to benefit from meditation. We must be grounded so that we can properly conduct the electrical energy within our body. We must be grounded for our body's electrical system to work. To do this, we must be sitting directly on the ground, making contact with our buttocks, or sitting unshot in a chair with our feet on the ground. If we sit on a pillow, or have something else between our buttocks and the ground, it acts as an insulator, and we are not grounded. If we sit in a chair wearing shoes, it's the same thing. We're insulated and not grounded. If we're not grounded, our electrical system doesn't work properly. Nikola Tesla is quoted as saying, if you wish to understand the universe, think of energy, frequency, and vibration. Vibration is a principle of hermetics. Vocalization, called a mantra, is a crucial meditative vibratory ingredient. Vibration created by our vocalized mantra 
help synchronize the rhythms of our body, mind, and the energy force of our spirit that binds them together. Our mantra is like a tuning fork. When tuned to the proper frequency, our body, mind, and spirit vibrate harmoniously as one, much as a harmonic waveform generator. Meditation begins with relaxation and clearing the mind of all thought and emotion. The sound and vibration of the four points of entry, our oscillating mantra emanates from our throat, guttural via the instructive tongue heard by the attentive ear, residing in the faithful breast, our heart, the pectoral, traveling outward via the central nervous system to our hands, manual, and feet, pedal. It's the vocalization of the mantra, the secret word of a master mason, the sound and vibration of it throughout our four points of entry that harmonizes our mind and body. When our mind and body harmonize, our spirit harmonizes. We experience three-part harmony. Enlightenment occurs when we attain perfect pitch, experiencing four-part harmony of mind, body, and spirit synchronized with and resonating in our soul. When we meditate, we are tapping into a higher level of energy awareness, becoming one with the universe. Once we attain the perfect pitch of enlightenment, we are not and cannot be as we once were. We are forever changed. Meditation is the stairway to heaven, to resurrection and enlightenment. By perfecting our emotions, thoughts, and decisions, we distill imperfections of mind, body, and spirit that encapsulate our soul, our character, symbolized as a grain of salt dissolved in water. We are altars of a sacred temple, a temple commanding reverence and respect, one meriting continual maintenance and improvement, only with continual effort in pursuit of unity, peace, and harmony of mind, body, and spirit, may we walk uprightly before God and our fellow man. Only with continual effort may we change our minds, deeds, and character. When we attain perfection, we rise from the ashes of what we once were, rising as a phoenix, the bird of Hermes, as an enlightened soul, eternal in the heavens. We, each and every one of us, are a seed for change, an oblong square, a philosopher's stone, if we choose to be. This is what masonry teaches us and gives us the tools to do. If we think about it, Myers quote, of races refers to our body as the philosopher's stone when he says that the stone is a triangle in its essence and a quadrilateral in its quality. The essence of our physical body, the red stone, are our cardiopulmonary, digestive, and nervous systems contained within the quality of our musculoskeletal frame. In addition, our heart is in the center of our torso, our faithful breast. It is the pump that provides for the flow of oxygen in our blood from our lungs and exchange of carbon dioxide. As such, the red stone is concerned with the physical plane of existence represented by a square. The essence of the white stone, our mind, are the thalamus, pituitary gland, and pineal gland of the brain contained within our skull. Together, the thalamus, pituitary gland, and pineal gland regulate and harmonize all bodily functions. Our brain, like our heart, has four chambers. Our mind, as the white stem, has a higher function than that of our physical body. Whereas our body offers the stability of a quadrilateral, its functions center on itself as a physical microcosm. In contrast, our mind addresses that which is not physical, and operates in the abstract spiritual plane of existence with a macrocosmic view. Our mind as the white stem is flexible and subject to change. Therefore, it's represented as a triangle. The philosopher's stone is about life. 
microcosmic, and macrocosmic. Understanding the Philosopher's Stone is a mystery, a secret. Its secrets are hidden in its symbols, allegory, and metaphor. Of interest is that its geometrical representation encapsulates the fabric of the universe, inclusive of a space-time continuum. It identifies a cosmic portal in accordance with the laws of physics, especially the laws of thermodynamics, that accommodates rebirth as a soul. This portal allows energy movement without regard to space, time, dimension. Before discussing resurrection or rebirth further, it's important we understand how these words are defined. Resurrection is defined as rising again to life after being dead. It's the act of being resuscitated. Rebirth is defined as a revival, a second chance, or spiritual regeneration. It is a new or second birth which involves metempsychosis, meaning the passing of the soul at death into another body, either human or animal. So, while resurrection and rebirth may appear synonymous, their nuanced connotations are quite different. For example, when we say Jesus was resurrected after being crucified, what we're saying is that he was brought back to life from unconsciousness or apparent death, that he was resuscitated. When Jesus died, we say that he was reborn, referring to his spiritual regeneration. What we ignore is the implication that at death, his soul transferred to another body, possibly human, but possibly something else. It's this transference of the soul, metempsychosis, that provides for life everlasting through reincarnation in accordance with Buddhist doctrine. Reincarnation is an intriguing concept. There are several ways that it can be viewed. In one regard, we could argue that when we are born, we are born in the image of our parents and our ancestors. At conception, the energy of our parents' genetic makeup is converted through their DNA. We are a reproduction of our parents, created in their image, receiving half of our genetic makeup from our mother and half from our father. Our parents and ancestors, in theory, are reborn and will continue to live on through us and our descendants after they die. So long as we continue to propagate, our ancestors and parents enjoy everlasting life. Another way of considering reincarnation is using a vessel of water as an analogy. Let's say that you have a vessel of water. The vessel represents your body. The water represents your mind, your personality and life force, your spirit. What happens if you drop the vessel of water and it breaks? What happens if the vessel of water has deteriorated with age and crumbles into pieces? The broken vessel at some point returns to the earth where it's repurposed. It might continue to deteriorate to become food for animals or plants, or maybe something altogether different. Ultimately, it will become something other than it once was. The vessel, our body, will not be in the same physical form we once recognized, but it will be repurposed and always continue to exist. This holds true for the water that was in the vessel too. The water doesn't cease to exist just because we drink it, or it spills out of a broken vessel. All water evaporates at some point, rising into the atmosphere and returning to Earth, repurposed as something else. It's a never-ending cycle. Water is our life, our spirit. Remember, water is life. Let's think about Egypt. The ancient Egyptians held a strong belief in the afterlife. They believed that your physical body, your ak, contained your personality, your ba, and your spiritual life force, your soul, ka. When you died, your ba and ka left your body and flew off. During the day, your ba kept watch over and protected your family, and your ka went to the land of two fields, so that your ba and ka could find their way home to your body 
your tomb had to have your name engraved upon it in a cartouche. Otherwise, your Ba and Ka would be lost forever. You would disappear and cease to exist. Picture a mummy in your mind. Does its sarcophagus have the appearance of a capsule, an egg, a seed? Yes, it does, representative of an oblong square. Now think about how a battery works. A battery uses a chemical reaction between alkaline and acidic sources to produce electricity. Our body does the same. During the mummification process, organs are removed from the body. The body is then placed in natrium and dehydrated. Natrium is a very dry salt consisting of sodium bicarbonate and sodium chloride. It's alkaline and removes all water and oxygen from the body, leaving carbon-based matter. The body is then anointed with oils that are acidic, wrapped in linen, and placed in a sarcophagus. The chemical reaction between alkaline and acidic chemicals produces hydrogen. Hydrogen has one electron and easily bonds with other elements. Its atomic number is one. It's the most abundant element in the universe. In living matter, it's found in conjunction with carbon and oxygen. Hydrogen is found in the oceans along with oxygen, sodium, and chlorine. So, we have the chemical composition of our oblong square as the Philosopher's Stone. Hydrogen and oxygen bond to create water. Sodium and chlorine bond to create salt and carbon. Could hydrogen contain the soul? It is possible that the soul is encapsulated in a hydrogen molecule. Hydrogen is an energy carrier. It's not a source of energy as it must be produced. This could occur at death if water electrolysis is employed, such as in mummification, that separates hydrogen from oxygen. It also explains the Egyptian concept of the soul as consisting of two parts, ka and ba. Think of resurrection in electromechanical terms as an alternator in your car. When it's new, it works great. Your battery stays charged. In time, the alternator's brushes wear down until it no longer works. Your battery doesn't retain a charge and it dies. Your car is essentially dead until you repair or replace the alternator and recharge the battery, resurrecting it. Life has environmental needs that must be met for sustainability. Secondly, in accordance with the laws of thermodynamics, conservation, and entropy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be repurposed in order to expand. Let's say we have a soul. In the physical world here on Earth, a soul is conceived and contained within a physical mind and body bound by our spirit. If we consider a soul as a hydrogen discharge of positive and negative chemical forces, we become a battery discharging hydrogen in response to the cycles of nature. It oscillates as alternating current. Tesla was right, so was Einstein. But our concept of time, space, and dimension are relative only to man on Earth. They don't necessarily apply to universal time because they are man-made construct applicable only to Earth's relationship with its sun. In that regard, time is microcosmic and not applicable in a microcosm of the universe. When a union of opposites occurs, energy is transferred and merged in a spark of divine love, creating a pocket of order, enabling chaos to expand in accordance with the laws of thermodynamics. A soul, a point within a circle, is formed and life begins. We have an expansion of mind and body bound by spirit encapsulating a soul that grows as consciousness within the spirit of the universal womb. As the mind, body, and spirit age, they deteriorate and ultimately collapse. 
death. The soul is released from its physical, mortal bounds and returns to its primal state of divine love within the universal womb where it's reconstituted. This is the regenerative cycle of nature, life, death, and rebirth. As an equation, it's expressed as alpha, omega, alpha, and symbolized as an ouroboros representing ophicus. In contrast, resurrection is for the living. It's a process of transformation, metamorphosis, that often includes pain and suffering caused by ego. Transcending our physical limitations through meditation, we can experience the spirit of divine love, peace, and illumination, oneness. Meditation enables us to atone, destroy our ego, and bow our head to our feet in humility, allowing the energy to awaken the kundalini at the base of the spine and flow through the chakras as inner peace. It's a beginning without end, life everlasting, eternity that is a vehicle to achieve oneness with the universe. As such, the equation for re resurrection is alpha, alpha, signifying a beginning without end and life everlasting, symbolized as a point within a circle denoting our soul. And thus we find the alchemical symbol for the Philosopher's Stone. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this presentation of The Order of Ophicus. Yes. Greetings and peace, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. Today, I have the honor and privilege of being joined by my dear brother and friend, Richard E. Kretz, PhD. Uh, Richard has been a great friend and brother to me and has always supported me in my Masonic journey. And I am who I am today. It's because of the love and support of brothers like Richard. And as, as you have seen the presentation of the Order of Ophicus, I hope you were able to take something away from it and apply those lessons to your daily life. So now Brother Richard will join us for a Q&A and different explanations of the points made in the order of Ophicus presentation. So without further ado, good morning and welcome to our dear brother. Good morning, Sal. Thank you, Brother Rich. And the first question that came, came to my mind is, in this society that we're living in, where relations and jobs and the infrastructure as we know it is changing so much, including the family unit, how can we apply the philosophy of the order of Ophicus to our daily lives to be good human beings? That's a very good question. One, I'm glad that you asked. What it boils down to is this, is that the Philosopher's Stone I, in my estimation, it makes what God wants from us. And what does God want? God wants us to love him, mm -hmm. to love ourselves, and to love each other. Charity is love in action. And that actually pertains to selfless service to help other people. And again, that's what masonry is all about. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And another question that, that came in was, if today was your last day, Brother Rich, for any of us, what philosophy of the order of ficus would you suggest to us for us to leave a better world behind? For those that love you, you love them, what message would you give to humanity? To be charitable, uh, you know, to actually use your love and put it into action to help others so that as we look to the future, you know, we can hopefully work towards building a better world. Yes, definitely. And I agree. I, I agree with that because we're all walking each other home and we owe this love and light to one another in this short human life that we're dealing with, which goes to my next question, Brother Rich, is now we're dealing with a society where human interaction is getting less and less with the technology and artificial intelligence. How can we infuse 
the different teachings of the Order of Ophicus to make sure that we don't lose that human touch and connection as time and technology progresses more and more in our lives? That is really an important question. Um, essentially, I think what you're driving at is that as we have progressed, and progression can be a good thing, we have simultaneously digressed. In other words, with the advent of technology, the more technology that is, has become available, the more that we seem to have forgotten the old ways, you know, how to actually have a conversation, to write letters, mm. to, you know, just to interact with one another and care for each other. And it, the driver really goes down to the family union. You know, we don't sit down at table and have dinners like we used to, you know, not that many years ago. Um, we don't look out for one another to the same extent that we once did. So we've become, I really don't know the term to use for it, mm -hmm. but perhaps apathetic. You know, we have lost empathy, you know, and that's not to mean that we should be more emotional. That's not necessarily the case, but we need to express greater concern for one another, you know, our society as a whole, our country, you know, whatever our faith may be. Uh, these are things that we need to get back to. They are the foundations that, you know, we are supposed to be strong in and to build upon. And again, that's what masonry teaches us. Indeed, my brother. And I, and I thank you for that beautiful answer, which goes to my next question is the aspect of God being Captain Kirk, who has kind of planted the seed for humanity. How, how would God view us right now in our current condition and is, do we have the aspect of the free will or would we have any kind of divine interference if humanity gets too out of control? Again, that's a good question. And it's a very difficult one. Um, it's not my place to presume what God may or may not think about me or anyone else. Um, I, I think that, you know, if nothing else, he's keeping an eye on us. He wants us to be the best that we can possibly be as far as humans. Uh, and with that in mind, if I, if I happen to be in his position and being what we as humans are doing, my greater concern was, would be how well are we taking care of our planet as well as one another? Are we being good stewards? You know, do we have an eye towards the future to say, okay, are we recognizing that what we are doing today is going to have a long-term impact in the generations that follow us? That would be my concern. You know, how well are we progressing in that regard? Thank you. And you are absolutely right, my brother, because we inherit this world from those who have fought for it, bled for it, and have passed it down to us in our current generation. So it is our responsibility to give a better world to those that are coming after us. And I, and I thank you for that. So going to my next question is, in the, this time of great division and chaos, whether it's racial, religious, political, whichever way that people are divided in, in, amongst each other, how can the philosophies and the practices and teachings of the order of Ophicus bring humanity back together in unison? Again, a very good question. And I'll answer it from an alchemist perspective, okay? Where you may have two coins, one gold and one silver, and you show them to an alchemist and ask them about it. And an alchemist may say that there is one similarity and one difference. What are those? What is the similarity and what is the difference? 
Well, it's pretty straightforward. The similarity is that they are both matter. The difference is that they are two different kinds of matter. The rest of it happens to be, you know, just associated with the original matter. So that that's, you know, I'll leave you with that thought. <laughs> that, that's absolutely perfect, my brother. And the alchemist and the Sufi perspective kind of ties into that, basically, that it's all a matter of perception and how you're willing to uh, deal with the circumstances that are presented to you. Which goes to my next question is, uh, the aspect of the order of Wolficus represents the serpentine energy in many ways. So for those that view the aspect of the serpent as uh, something that's malevolent, how would you describe this to them? Well, to answer that, I think if the serpent has been much maligned uh, because it has been misunderstood. A serpent represents the duality of nature. You know, it represents because when you hold a, a serpent in your hand, you're not able to discern whether or not it is male or female, or necessarily if it's poisonous or non-poisonous, or what its intent may be, because it's a rather unemotional entity. Mm -hmm. So you don't know if it's good or bad. And another perception is that serpents are tricky because they inherently hide under rocks or in trees or in bushes. And because they hide, they often are not seen. And in that regard, they're considered to be a cult. And sadly, a cult has a very bad connotation, although it means nothing more than that which is hidden. Does that yeah, I, I, I think that answers my question, my brother, and I thank you for that. The aspect of the order of Ophicus, let's say going to the next question, how can it benefit modern Freemasonry right now, which is kind of uh, not that shrouded anymore in esoteric studies? So how can the philosophy and teachings of the Order of Ophicus help modern Masonry kind of get back to those roots of equality and brotherly love and applying those philosophies to our lives and teachings? That's an excellent question. And I'll answer it in that what I have seen uh, in masonry today, you, you touched on in the question, and that is uh, there has been essentially a movement away from the esoteric. You know, whether it's masonry or templary or Rosicrucianism or Sufism or any of the other myriad ancient initiatic orders, the root of them all happens to be with dealing with the esoteric, and that means folks that are interested in or have knowledge about certain uh, topics, and the occult. And if you look at masonry, when you go back and you look at the writings in just the 1800s, and you can even go back earlier than that to the earliest beginnings, especially if you're in the Elizabethan era, and you will find that it was very, very esoteric and very occult. And as we have moved forward, uh, again, going back to the 1800s, you see that there was an increase in membership, okay, and that it plateaued sometime around the 1960s. And then we've since been on this precipitous, well, not necessarily a precipitous, but in a decline of about 1% per year, but that builds exponentially. So the question is why? What has occurred, you know, from the 1800s, they inspired good men to become members and become, you know, uh, pillars of their community. What did Masonry or Rosicrucianism or Sufism or any of these orders offer at that time so that the membership increased, that it was desirable? And then we have to say, okay, at, in the 1960s, what changed? What changed so that we began to lose membership and that men slowly began to lose interest in becoming a member 
of such a wonderful fraternity. And the root of it, when you really look at it, happens to be the employment of symbology, esoteric and occult knowledge. You know, once we started moving away from that, then our membership has begun to go, begun to go downhill. Uh, at least that's my opinion. Uh, you know, historical numbers seem to substantiate that. But it's an area that I think if any of the orders began to put more emphasis on, in addition to just the rote ritual, going through the motions, the regurgitation of certain uh, actions and verbiage, and really begin to understand, you know, the root of where we began, things may change. You know, there is opportunity there. Definitely, my brother. And I, I agree with you completely. There has to be that change and that effort to make a change. Because once our intention is pure, as what I learned from the teachings of the Order of Ophicus, it's about the purity of your heart and applying those principles of light, love, purity, and see a world where you present yourself as a conduit of that energy, which goes to my next question is, my generation, Brother Rich, is suffering from a lack of commitment. We don't have those things anymore in terms of a family unit, honoring each other in relationships, uh, being faithful to each other, uh, a man committing to a woman or a woman committing to a man, vice versa, uh, the aspects of the job market changing, and so many things which are ending the world as we know it in many ways. So how can the order of Rolficus and its philosophy help my generation kind of get out of that hole that they put themselves in? Again, uh, another very good question. And to answer that, I'll say that the order of Rolficus is a natural philosophy that incorporates many, many, many of, you know, the ancient initiatic uh, tenets and methodologies or the modalities of doing things. So going forward really boils down to being the best we can be in the eyes of God and in the eyes of our fellow man. And, you know, living by example. And that's the most important thing. We have to live by example. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean that we have to go out and proselytize, you know, and advertise all that we're doing. Because if we do that, that's a violation of one of our, our essential tenets or our virtues, and that's humility. Mm. You know, if we begin to do those things, then that's not selfless service. But if we just simply live by example, that is... And hopefully, if we are living properly, by example, then that will provide the inspiration and motivation for others to say, hey, you know what? That guy, you know, he's out there. He's doing what we're supposed to be doing, doing what others talk about, but not doing. And that's really what it boils down to, you know, and it's not necessarily to go out and say, we need to try and reach an entire group of people and bring them into the fold. Because the reality is, it's doubtful that could happen. But if each one of us can reach out and embrace and help one other person, and then they pass that on to another person, then you know, hopefully that will begin to make a shift, to change things, to help improve things. And that's where we have to look in the future. Live by example. Thank you, my brother. And that's absolutely right, because even in the Sufi path, they teach us the aspect of humility and brotherhood. And to have this aspect of charity, where the right hand doesn't know what the left is doing and vice versa. And Rumi said one time that if you do a good deed, just drop it in the ocean. And one day when you're suffering in the desert, they'll come back to you. So in this life, we do get out what we put in and we have to 
lead by example, not by titles or any uh, prestige or accolades, but what kind of a human being you are in times of need. And when somebody needs your assistance, that's when you get tried and tested. And I know in the Sufi path, what a lot of the masters do, I've seen in the East, what they do is they also disguise themselves as beggars to test you on purpose to see if you would give them anything, which is very similar to the, uh, the, Ro- uh, the Romans where they have the Salominari or what they refer to as the inner earth people who are these wizards and they come out and test you as beggars. And if you pass their test and they open the heart of Romania up to you. So the, the Sufis are like, are like that in the same way, which goes to my next question is, the Mesopotamian roots that we're looking at and what I learned from you in the Order of Ophicus presentation, as did the audience who has watched this, what can we learn from the Mesopotamian et- etiquettes like the story of Gilgamesh and the aspects of brotherly love that we can uh, relate to today? Well, that's a, an interesting question. Uh, I don't know. I think that, you know, whether when you're looking at the Mesopotamian cultures, whether it's, you know, the Sumerians, the Akkadians, the Hittites, the Assyrians, you know, it, the Babylonians, you know, the thing was with them, when you look at them culturally as a society, uh, they were actually fairly tight knit. No, they didn't always get along. Uh, but they were very thoughtful, you know, in the beginning of civilization um, with regard to religious practices, they were all very, very comparable. Um, yeah, the deities or the gods and goddesses fought about them amongst themselves. But I think those were reflections of what we saw within ourselves. You know, it was a manifestation of human nature and a way of saying, okay, you know, this isn't necessarily a good thing or this is a good thing. And how do we address it, you know, to teach a moral lesson? And I think, you know, if we're looking at the Mesopotamian religions in particular, you know, whether it's the story of Gilgamesh, or it's in the Enuma Elis, um, or even within the stories of the Bible and the Quran, uh, and other, you know, the Vedic texts, and any of the other ancient texts, regardless of culture or location throughout the world, they all come back to basically the same thing. And it's to say, hey, you know what? You know, there are certain things that we need to pass on from one generation to another. And it's the of what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, and essentially what is good and what is bad behavior, you know, so that in knowing these things, we can get together and have a social consciousness and build on that. And when we're able to build on it and establish a foundation, then we can improve. So they too, in my estimation, were looking forward thinking they were looking at future generations. And that's essentially the basis of all of those ancient stories, myths, or legends, or whatever you may, may wish to call them. Thank you. And that, that makes complete sense because in the stories of Gilgamesh and the Mesopotamian stories, they are basically all a reflection of the human thought and the human state of existence and what we can learn from them. And what stood out to me especially was the aspect of Gilgamesh when he was out of control and and Enkaidu comes into his life as his brother and he helps him, gets himself under control, which comes to my next question is with the order of Ophicus, Brother Rich, how can we use the philosophy to circumscribe our desires and live life within due bounds with the teachings of the order of Ophicus? Well, again, that's a very good question. I'll digress to the previous question for just a moment, though, uh, and touch on the 12 labors of Hercules. Again, they were all reflections of human nature that the Greeks had built upon from the Mesopotamian background. And now that I've forgotten that question, (laughs) what was it again? (laughs) So the uh, previous question, my brother, was that how can, like, basically... 
uh, the order of Ophicus philosophy help us in learning from the Mesopotamian stories and applying those lessons in correlation? That's, that's a good question. I would say that <clears throat> what it encourages is reflection and a quest for knowledge. And the analogy I will use can be found within the tarot itself. Um, that being that the very first card of the major arcana within the tarot deck is the fool. And if you look at that particular card, you know, the fool, you know, he's a very colorful person. He's kind of clueless out on this adventure. And the little dog is warning him, but he's not paying any attention. And if you noticed that that particular card is numbered zero. And mm -hmm. the zero, it has neither a beginning nor an end. So what that tells us is that <laughs> Our journey, our quest for the grail has no end. It's, it doesn't have a destination. It's a lifelong thing. And we move forward with that quest for knowledge, that thirst for knowledge, and being unaware of all the inherent dangers that are around us. You know, whether it's a quixotic quest and we have to be careful of the windmills or, or whatever it is, then we move forward until we get to the hermit. And the hermit is atop a mountain and he's cloaked and his face is somewhat shrouded and he has a staff and he's holding his lantern up very high. And the reason he's holding that lantern up high is because he has acquired the knowledge and he is attempting to illuminate the occult path of the esoteric fool. And note too that the number of the hermit's card is nine and it's done in Roman numerals. It says IX. In other words, in one sense, you could say that it re get, re excuse me, represents not just the beginning as a one, but it is a union of opposites. Taking the X where you have your upward triangle and your downward triangle. So, you know, I think that's, that's very important to understand that we have, a, we essentially start out as fools on a journey that doesn't have a destination. And as we grow in our knowledge and experience, we acquire wisdom. And with that in mind, a metamorphosis has occurred a transmutation. So that is an aspect of the philosopher's stone, you know, that we can, can look at within the tarot deck itself. So I, I hope that answers your question. It, it does, my brother, and it and really answers it in the best way that it can. And I, I thank you dearly for that, which goes to my next question, Brother Rich, is the aspect of what I see in the Sufi path or the Islamic path is basically complete submission to the will of God and applying the principles from the order of Ophicus and the philosopher's stone. How do they relate to each other in terms of surrendering to the divine and even what masonry teaches us to put our full faith in the Supreme being? Ah, excellent. What it boils down to is that we are often manipulated by attitudes, beliefs, and values mm. we have been programmed with since birth by our parents, our family, our friends, our teachers, our religious elders. But if we are to advance, we have to move away from that paradigm, from mm. that model. And as we go forward, we have to remove the construct of it all. So what I'm saying is that we have to get out of the box that we have been put into. Remove the construct of that box, because what the box has, <clears throat> that paradigm or that construct 
is it has put blinders on us. Here we are sitting in a box and we can see everything around us inside the box, but we're not able to see beyond it. And that's really what we need to do is to look beyond. And that's what the order of Ophigus encourages, looking beyond, you know, it's, and that requires not just a shift in our paradigms, it requires the removal of the construct of the box. You get rid of the box altogether and guess what? Your vision is unobstructed. It becomes broad and all encompassing. You can see things for what they truly are without being influenced by you know, other attitudes, beliefs, or values. Thank you, my brother. And you know, I, I agree with you completely on the aspect of being outside of the box. When I came to America when I was five years old and my father brought me here for a better life, I saw the aspects of how welcoming everything is like around you, where one time I was at a mosque, then there is a local church that I went to, and I read the Bible with them, with the kids and, and the individuals that were there at that time. I went to the Sikh temples, and they were serving food in there, and I realized everyone is kind of teaching you the same exact thing. It's a code of conduct of how to be a good human being with these different practices, etiquettes, and things like that. And that helped me think outside of the box that we're all being constructed to be divided from each other, the aspect of your God and my God. But in reality, it's the same system. It's uh, six different highways, but it's taking you to the same destination. And that's what I really love about these order of Ophicus. It's, it's teaching you that that as long as you are on the path of purity, love, understanding between yourself and mankind and all beings on this world, then that's what the Philosopher's Stone and the Order of Ophicus really means. And I, and I thank you for that, which goes to my next question. As you said, to think outside of the box, there is a quote from Hassan Saba, the old man of the mountain, who's the leader of the assassins and the Ismaili uh, Shias at that time. And he had a quote that nothing is true and everything is permitted. So how from the order of a ficus is, uh, pr uh, perspective, can you break that down? Oh, that's a tough question. You know, how, how can one improve on that? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, so, you know, I don't want to get above my pay grade here, so to speak. But, you know, again, it comes back to, you know, the perception of an alchemist, mm -hmm. you know, and as a, you, you talked, uh, touched on here, you know, with the various religions, you know, is, is that really so different from the chemical perspective of matter? You know, matter is what it is. And, you know, you have similarities in that everything is matter. So all religions are simply that. They are a religion. And what is the difference? The difference is nothing more than the way they approach essentially the same core beliefs, which when you really get down to it, is love. Mm -hmm. Yes, my brother, I, I agree with you definitely. And that's what I realized in my life um, as I approach age 30 by the summer and I realized that only true love is the answer. Everything that we look around, it has its uh, forms of control and it kind of like a lot of systems are designed to keep you in a box in many ways. And I realized that even looking at my culture and I realized, OK, so what they're doing is they're mixing a lot of their cultural values with what the religion teaches. And it's like a, a tribe caste system that's been followed way before the religion even came to existence. So how can the order of Ophicus help us and the philosophy around it help us break out of these chains that have been placed on us for us to not be united with one another for us to be separate from one another for us to when we look at somebody that looks differently than us to have this aspect of fear that rushes in so how can we use those practices and little by little improve ourselves so we don't feel those things anymore you know that that's again a very good and a very important question um what we are experiencing now, I think, are very divisive times. Mm -hmm. you know, and we see various groups 
setting people or individuals against one another. And the bottom line is they say, okay, you're either one of us or you're one of them, you know? I think the, yes. hang on everyone. I think the connection got stuck a little bit. This happens with Zoom sometimes. Hopefully it should, should be good now. Let me see. What we have to say is. Uh, Brother Rich, you, you cut out for the last 15 seconds. Okay. Yeah. It's saying that my internet connection is unstable. Now, is it back? Yeah, you're good. It's only the last 15 seconds that cut out. So please. Uh, okay. So where were we at? Uh, we were talking about the aspect of the order of ficus, my brother, and how can it eliminate this uh, fear that humans naturally have of each other that look differently than them and or believe differently than them? Okay. Well, the divisiveness comes from a number of groups. And mm -hmm. what they try to do is separate us out. Essentially, they use fear as a tool mm -hmm. and the attitude that you are either one of them but are with them or against them. The order of Ophicus is saying, hey, you know what? Let's take a step back for a moment. Let's think about this because we really should be free thinkers. Something mm -hmm. truly advocated during the age of enlightenment were the age of reason back in the 1700s, early 1800s, where, you know, and that, that's essentially where the founding documents of the United States had evolved from. That was during the age of reason. And the idea was that, okay, we are each entitled to our own opinions, okay, based on the knowledge or the information that we have acquired. But it's incumbent upon each and every one of us to do our own research and to say, hey, you know what, there is an, an issue or there is, is something that I'm interested in and I have thoughts about it, but are these thoughts valid? You know, mm -hmm. take to either validate or to refute what I think or I believe. So again, it's inherent on each and every one of us to go out and do our own research and not say, okay, just because Joe the plumber over here happens to believe in this or is a member of that. And regardless of how emotional he is about it and how dedicated he is to it, number one, the first question I'm going to ask, is it a good fit for me? You know, does, you know, based on what my research indicates, is, does it have substance? Is his position based on a good foundation? And that's something that sadly we have uh, failed to do anymore, that the or order of Ophicus encourages, and that's to be a free thinker. Yes. Unfortunately, when you become a free thinker, you oftentimes acquiring knowledge and learning things that are contrary to what other individuals or other groups would like you to know. And when that happens, you often become identified as or labeled as a heretic. Mm -hmm. So is her being a heretic necessarily a bad thing? No, it's not. Being a heretic is someone that says, hey, you know what? I think outside of the box. Mm -hmm my own mind, my own decisions, and have my own opinions. And based on my own research and not what others have told me, this is my position. So when you can look at it from that perspective, you have established a fairly good foundation. Is it to say that, you know, your thoughts and your opinions won't change based on the acquisition of more knowledge? No, it's not. That, you know, so you have a level of flexibility in there because as you evolve in your knowledge and as a person, things do change. How you feel and what you think today 
is based on things that you've learned. But again, as you acquire knowledge, those thoughts and those feelings may change. They could evolve into something else, into a position that is in direct opposition to your position today even. So again, what it does is allow for fluidity. Hmm. Thank you, my brother. And that's absolutely true. And I agree with you on all of those points made because right now, humanity is in the condition that it is in because of these boxes that we've all been placed in, whether it's cultural or social or any kind of fear-based mind control or the aspect of um, the religion being taught by leaders who want to maintain their own control rather than teach you the truth of what it is to put your faith in God and be a free human being. And uh, that's what I benefited from the order of Ophicus, that it teaches you to be a free thinker, to be a free mind, and the aspect that God has given you free will, and that you must use it for the right reasons for this life that you've been given, and to use it for the right reasons to help each other, to uplift each other, and to see what can I do to help mankind without any pros or pearls. Because the, the grand architect of the universe, in whichever way you perceive it, does take account of your deeds. And there's a lot of unseen humanity that goes on, which uh, goes to my next question, Brother Rich, is when we look at uh, Socratic thoughts or Neoplatonic thoughts, how can we relate that to the order of Ophicus and basically get a general overview of those teachings? Well, you know, it does, the order of Ophicus, again, it's a natural philosophy and it's predicated on the philosophies of the ancients. So, you know, when you're looking at Socratic or Neoplatonic uh, Platonic thought, yes, all of those things are incorporated in it. Um, so, okay, let's see. What's going on with the internet? Yeah, hang, hang tight, everyone. Hang tight. When we uh, talk- brother, brother Rich, sorry about that. It, it cut out again when you said the um, when you were about to explain the the, the Neoplatonic and Socratic thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for heaven's sakes! Is it back up? Yes, it is. It, it this okay. is being this is being interfered with. <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, I'll, I have an idea why, which I don't want to express on. <laughs> um, I can, you know, once we cut off here, are we being recorded still? Okay, once yes. we recorded, I, I, can, I can share some things, you know, because of where I am at. Got it. So anyway, trying to pick up on that. Um, with regard to, you know, the uh, Aristotle or the Neoplatonic, or any of the other uh, thoughts of the ancient Greeks or even the Romans, uh, when you're looking at Seneca or Cicero or some of them, you know, where did they get their ideas? You know, those guys were living, what, two, 3,000 years ago. And, you know, oftentimes as far back as that. But a lot of those ideas in my end, my thoughts are that they were conceived during the course of the Mesopotamian cultures, mm. because they, they were highly educated. They were highly involved with the arts and, the, and sciences. Poetry, especially, and philosophy were a major part of those civilizations. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure that during those times that the ideas were, you know, it, at least, you know, conceived and they were brought forward and worked even further as the generations continued on until we get to, you know, the Greeks and things and the Egyptians. But they're all building blocks, you know, uh, taking what may be considered the best parts of them that seem to, you know, make sense and use them to build a platform uh, to create a very solid foundation 
that we can build even further upon. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I hope that answers the question. It does, my brother. And I thank you so much. And this wraps up the, the Q&A session. And I thank you so much for allowing me to do this with you. And I am very honored and privileged to be able to learn from the natural philosophy of the Order of Ophicus. And when this uh, video presentation is uploaded on YouTube, the combination of the presentation and this Q&A uh, yourself, you have the full rights to the video. And okay. you, 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 may, you may do with it as you please. So any closing thoughts, my brother? Uh, no, I mean, I've really enjoyed it. You've, you posed excellent questions. I'm very impressed with that. Uh, you have been a true and faithful friend through the course of our, uh, you know, I guess the last couple of years, uh, even during trying times. So, yes. you know, that is, is greatly appreciated, you know, and really appreciate that. Thank you, my brother. And likewise, the same for me to you. And that's, that's what it is. If individuals like us stick with each other and uplift each other, and we can only be that example like the Order of Ophicus teaches us to humanity. And with that, I give you my fraternal love and regards. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. And please share this philosophy and teachings with whoever you can, because it's much needed for all of us. So thank you again, Brother Rich.